Hello everyone. I wanted to add this video about intelligence and IQ testing because I think it's a really important part of psychology and a really interesting part of psychology too. So we're going to talk about IQ testing, how valid IQ tests are, and why IQ testing is actually controversial and why people have such negative feelings about IQ testing. And then I'm also going to talk about intellectual disabilities and kind of what settings might um, IQ testing be really useful for. You know, criminal justice settings might not be an area you'd think about, um, but IQ testing is really important in that area, and we're going to talk about why, and also in schools and in medical settings as well. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about IQ testing and why people have kind of a negative viewpoint of IQ testing. IQ testing was originally developed in the early 1900s by Alfred Brené, and his original goal was just to identify kids that were struggling in school and how we could help them. But unfortunately, people took that test and used it to try to rate people's intelligence. And they also used it to try to prove that other races were inferior. Um, and that's one of the reasons why people have some pretty negative um, in ideas about IQ testing. Um, there was a psychologist as early or late as 1969. It's kind of hard to imagine that racism was still pretty rampant in 1969 and that somebody could actually write um, a research study that sort of attempted to prove that people of color were genetically inferior and intellectually inferior to whites and Asians is what his theory was. His theory has been completely disproven. It is not true in any way at all. Um, we are all biologically equal. Um, Although there are people in the world that have intellectual disabilities that we'll talk about, but it doesn't have to do with their race. It has to do with um, lots of different reasons, actually, that people can have intellectual disabilities. But that's one of the main reasons why people are really negative about IQ testing. Also, traditionally, minorities have scored lower on IQ tests. And the reason for that is not because they're not as smart, um, although there was this assumption in the 1960s. Um, but the reason was that some of these tests were really culturally biased. They asked questions that maybe weren't familiar to kids of different races and different cultural back to, uh, backgrounds. Um, there's a I put this video in here of Good Times. It was a show in the 1970s, and this little boy comes home from school, and his parents ask him about the IQ test that he took. And he said, you know, the test doesn't test um, how smart you are. It really tests how white you are. And he gave an example of a question on the test was, that was about a teacup and a saucer. And he says, you know, we don't use saucers here. How, yeah, how would we know that that's what that is? And if you think about it, in modern times today, we don't use saucers very often at all. So, you know, it really depends on the context that you've grown up in. If you think about a kid that grew up on a farm, they're going to have different information than a kid that might grow up in the city. And so we have to make sure that our tests are culturally fair and that we're not giving bias to um, any particular group when we're asking questions. And this is something that has been worked on since the 1970s to try to improve the IQ testing and make sure that they're culturally fair and hopefully culturally neutral. Neutral. So, but Alfred Binet was the first to develop an IQ test in 1904, and he, it was really the first useful intelligence scale, and he was asked by the Paris School Board in France to design a test to identify kids with intellectual disabilities and try to figure out how we could actually help those kids. And his, they call this an intelligence scale because it rates your intelligence on a scale. Um, and his um, scale was designed for people from ages 2 to 85, which is a huge range of uh, ages. And we'll talk about if that could be problematic as well. But what he did was he designed questions so that an average child of that age could answer that question. So what he did, he normed the questions for each group. So he took a group of 10-year-olds, and he came up with questions he thought 10-year-olds would be able to answer. And he took a large group of 10-year-olds, asked them all these questions, and then he took the questions that the majority 
majority of those 10 year olds could get right. Um, and those were the questions that were normed for age 10. And the way he determined a child's IQ was he took their mental age. So these are the questions that a child would be able to answer. Um, so if, a, if you have a 10 year old that can answer 12 year old questions, their mental age is 12, their actual age or their chronological age is 10. Um, and when you divide that out and multiply it times 100, that gives that child 120 IQ, which is pretty good IQ, high intelligence there. Uh, Einstein apparently had 160 IQ, um, but most people, the average IQ is 100. Most people fall within this 85 to 115 range of IQ scores, um, but there are definitely people that are on the high end, and then there are people that are on the lower end, and we're going to talk about both of them. But we really want to talk about how is it that they we measure IQ? How do we know that it's accurate? So David Wexler in 19 55 came up with the Wexler IQ scales and he modeled his test a bit after Binet's test but he was critical of Binet's test because it only gave us one global score so that 120 IQ it just gave us an idea that yep that kid's fairly smart didn't really give us information about what areas that child might be struggling in so Wexler designed a test where there's different scales within that test so you do have one global IQ score but you also have scores in different different abilities so we could see whether the child was having trouble in reading or vocabulary or math. Um, and so that was um, one of the differences between the Binet scale. Um, today, the Wexler IQ test is the most widely used IQ test in the U.S., and it's considered the most accurate. Um, Wexler created tests for adults, children, and preschoolers. Um, so he really took Binet's idea but really perfected it and tried to make sure um, that we're really studying and getting a really good full picture of a child or adult's IQ. Um, Wexler's tests are continually updated and validated. So the, uh, the Wexler, uh, the WISC for children is in the fifth version now. So um, since 1955, it's been revised five times. Um, the COG AT and the Naglieri test that um, Dr. Morrison talked about in some of her other videos um, are actually not IQ tests. They're called cognitive abilities tests, and they're used to test for giftedness in elementary schools, um, and they're much shorter than an IQ test would be. Um, and it, when you think about it, the Wexler IQ test takes a lot of time to administer, and it takes a lot of time by a psychologist to administer it. So the Wexler IQ test and the Binet IQ test are both individual IQ tests, and what that means is a psychologist actually sits down with the adult or with the child and actually asks them each and every question on the test and rates their answer on the test and how long it took them to answer the test. Um, so it's a really cumbersome time uh, intensive test but it's also pretty accurate about somebody's personality and I mentioned this about a school psychologist so school psychologists work within schools to really assess behavioral issues as well as intellectual issues among students um, so Wexler was really trying to um, get at different types of intelligence, not just academic intelligence. So he came up, his test measures two different types of intelligence. One is called performance intelligence. So this is your ability to problem solve, to think on your feet, your spatial ability. And he came up with like five different tests to measure this type of intelligence. This is an example of one of his types of testing called picture completion. And what he asked the child is, what's missing in this picture? Now this thing where it says shadow and it has a little dot here wouldn't have been in the picture. So a really bright kid would probably understand that um, the tree has a shadow, so the man here should also have a shadow. Um, and so that's a really interesting uh, way to test somebody's intelligence and test their understanding of the world. Verbal intelligence is more about academic intelligence. How much have you learned? How much knowledge do you have? What's your vocabulary? What's your reading comprehension? Digit span is kind of interesting. This has to do with your short-term memory, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. But most people in their uh, short-term memory can remember seven plus or minus two items. And the more items 
items you could hold and use in your short-term memory, the higher your intelligence level. And the fewer that you can remember in your short-term memory, the lower your intellectual abilities are. And then they also did look at math abilities as well. So this is another example of the performance IQ part. So he would have children and adults do block pattern examples. And what he would do is he would have them look at the picture here and then use the blocks to make to match that image. Um, and for little kids, you can see the patterns are a little less complex. They get more and more complex as you complete each block pattern. So for the little kids, they had solid colored blocks, you know, solid red or solid white. For the adults, they had half red and half white. And you can see how complex some of these patterns can get. Um, and you were rated not only on whether you could complete the pattern or how long it took you to complete that pattern. So these are some more examples of picture completion. So in this one here, they're asking the child, what's missing in this picture? And of course, it's the mirror image of the doll it should be over here. This one here, we could we could make an argument for some cultural concerns and cultural bias in this. Um, if you grew up and never played cards before, you wouldn't get this answer right. Um, and what's missing in this particular card here is the diamond in the middle. So you need to have five diamonds and there should be a diamond in the middle. But if you never played cards, weren't familiar with cards, you wouldn't know that. And many people today don't play cards. So this is, both of these are older um, from an old, old version of the Wexler IQ test. Um, so I'm sure they've been updated now, but that's how you, you might see that there was some cultural bias in some of the older tests. People didn't, they were created by white people, testing white people, not really thinking about the fact that not everybody experiences the world exactly as they do. So the Wexler Intelligence Scale give us a really comprehensive view of somebody's intelligence. And IQ tests are critically important in schools, um, in medical cases where somebody might have a head injury, or maybe an elderly person is having some kind of cognitive decline. And then also in criminal justice cases when people have been charged with the serious crime. It's really important to understand their pers a person's intellectual ability in that case. Um, so these tests are quite sophisticated and constantly being updated and revised to ensure that they're valid, reliable, and culturally appropriate. And one of the ways they tell that they're valid First of all, the Wexler IQ tests are given probably to millions of kids across the United States. And so they look at those tests and, you know, if those tests are determining that a child has an intellectual disability or is intellectually gifted, does it appear that that child is uh, intellectually disabled or gifted? And if, you know, we're getting wrong results, then we would go back and look at what's wrong with the test. But we're getting accurate and valid results there. So the testing, IQ testing isn't perfect but it, it is um, pretty accurate and pretty sophisticated. So how do we know if an IQ test is valid and what does that mean uh, validity? So validity means does it measure what it's supposed to measure? So if it shows that a person is low IQ, or do they really appear to be? Um, so is the test accurate? And we've definitely found that with the Wexler IQ scale. Um, the is it reliable? So if I give a child a, a test in kindergarten and then I give them the same IQ test in third grade, they should have a pretty similar IQ score. You can definitely improve your IQ score, but generally it's a few points. So you're not going to go from below average to above average, um, but you could go from uh, slightly above average to more above average. So we want to make sure that um, the test is reliable and that you get similar results year after year. The Flynn effect is an interesting thing about IQ testing, especially in the United States. Um, James Flynn, a psychologist, came, came up with this observation about IQ testing that each new generation appears to have a significantly higher IQ than the previous generation. And we're not really sure what this is due to. We do know that kids are starting younger to learning to read, learning a lot more information at younger ages and learning a lot more complex information. So it might be why um, IQ is increasing. But that's the Flynn effect.
So I wanted to talk a little bit about intellectual uh, disabilities and learning disabilities and why IQ testing is really important in these areas. Well, first of all, kids with learning disabilities often have high IQs, at least average IQ, um, and that's how we can kind of identify that it's not an intellectual disability that's causing them to have difficulty in learning. It is a particular learning disability or a particular problem understanding and learning in a particular area. Um, so dyslexia is one of the most common learning disabilities and it's where a child has difficulty processing letters, really understanding the sounds that letter letters make. So when we talk about phonetic awareness, um, they're not processing the letters as sounds and they're having a lot of difficulty mixing up letters within words and in sentences and words within sentences. So it makes it really challenging for a child with dyslexia to learn to read. And there are many um, things that teachers can do to help children with dyslexia learn to read. Um, dysgraphia is where kids have difficulty writing legibly. It's a, it's a true learning disability and they also have trouble putting their thoughts down on paper so it's not just the physical act of writing but it's also putting the information together to be able to write it down. There's also dyscalculia where kids have trouble with math, mathematical calculations as well. So it's really important to understand you know does the child have an intellectual disability that's interfering with their learning or is it something else that we can help them with? Um, and learning disabilities are often comorbid with other disorders like attention deficit disorder. And that's another thing when we're looking at kids with behavioral problems. Do they have an intellectual disability or um, is their behavior interfering with their ability to learn? So intellectual disability is defined as an IQ of 70 or below. Um, and the average IQ you'll remember is 100. So 70 is pretty significantly below the average. And you know, we have kind of a gray area between that IQ score of 70 to 100, where somebody may have some intellectual difficulties, but isn't considered intellectually disabled. And that's something to think about. I don't know if many of you had this program in your high school. I hope that you did. Um, but there is a whole campaign to get rid of that term mental retardation. Um, so this is called spread the word to end the word. So they want to get rid of that word retard, especially. They usually try to say the R word instead of that, um, but the term mental retardation has definitely been used in a really negative way, um, and it's really uh, hurtful to people that do have intellectual disabilities. So the preferred term now is intellectual disability instead of mental retardation, and there's definitely a big push to uh, you know, abandon those terms. They're still used in legal documents and probably school documents still as well, but the preferred term is intellectual disability. So about 2% of the population suffers from an intellectual disability, and there's many reasons why someone may have an intellectual disability. The one that we most commonly may think of is Down syndrome. However, there are many people with uh, intellectual disabilities that don't have Down syndrome. Um, and kids also with Down syndrome can have an average IQ as well. So a lot of times we make assumptions based on how somebody looks and look at it based on their, we assume they have a particular intellectual level when somebody with Down syndrome might have an average IQ. And we might also see somebody that looks normal that does have an intellectual disability. So we have to be really cautious about looking at somebody and trying to assess their intellectual disabilities. We can't actually do that. And there's a huge range of intellectual disabilities among kids with Down syndrome and among all, all people with intellectual disabilities. So some people can have a mild intellectual disability um, and that's uh, probably that's 70 to oh, about 60 uh, about 55 it looks like here um, <clears throat> where they're able to live independently they learn to read and write um, and they can probably hold a part-time job moderate there they have some ability to read and write but they need supervision they can't live independently may need some directions on daily living skills and eating and those kinds of things a severe intellectual disability they need supervision they can't read and write um, and they probably need some help with their activities of daily living. Somebody with a profound intellectual disability may be completely nonverbal, unable to talk and communicate, and just cannot function on their own and need to have assistance for all of their uh, 
activities. Um, so this is the last slide I'm going to talk about. Should IQ fit be considered when somebody is charged with a crime? And the courts have actually ruled that yes, IQ is something that we really do need to look at when we're looking at somebody who has been charged with a pretty serious crime. In 2002, there was a ruling saying that um, we're not a that somebody that has a documented intellectual disability cannot receive the death penalty, um, and that that should be considered in their uh, proceedings for the criminal case. Um, I don't know if any of you saw this show called Making a Murderer on Netflix. It was popular a couple of years ago, um, and the sad thing is that the that this young kid here, Brendan Dassey. Um, was 16 years old, and his uncle was actually the one that committed the crime. His uncle lured a young woman to his trailer out in the country and murdered her and buried her in the backyard. And Brendan Dassey, supposedly, he actually confessed to helping with the crime and helping with the, um, burying the body in the backyard. However, when he was arrested, he was 16 years old, and he has an IQ of 73, which is pretty close to intellectual disability, but not quite there. Um, and he was put in an interrogation room by himself with uh, police detectives who were interviewing him. And after, I don't know how many hours, he confessed to the crime. But, um, you know, was he coerced? You know, is somebody that has an int intellectual disability more easily manipulated? Um, you know, are they fragile? Are they easily broken down and could be coerced into confessing to something that they didn't do? Just thinking that, oh, this will get this whole thing over with, not realizing that there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and also, could he have been manipulated by his uncle who was older and smarter and probably a little bit scary? So there are a lot of celebrities that are actually taking up his case, Kim Kardashian being one of them, trying to get his sentence reduced. He was given a life sentence for accessory to murder. Um, but there really are questions about this case because of his age and because of his IQ. Um, and anytime somebody is um, arrested and charged with a pretty serious crime, they do get a psychological evaluation whenever that is requested. And a psychological evaluation includes an IQ test um, because it's really important to understand a person's intellectual abilities. Um, there's also personality tests that are done and in interviews as well. Um, but it's really difficult sometimes as a psychologist to get a true picture of a person when you're only allowed to spend, I don't know how many hours interviewing that, them and talking with them. And an IQ is a really important part of understanding who a person is. So I just wanted you to know that IQ testing is really important. It's valuable and it can be quite accurate. Whether, you know, the difference between somebody that's above average intelligence or gifted or genius, you know, how accurate it is in that level, who knows. And also just because somebody has a high IQ doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be successful in life doesn't mean they have all different types of intelligence, just means that, <clears throat> it just gives us an idea of what their intellectual ability is.